Thank you very much. Thank you, Luke. It's, it's quite bright up here and frightening, um, does it, you know, even considering all the places I've been to. But anyway, so thank you for the invite. Thank you for the introduction. Um, something slightly different, just to tell you a little bit about who MSF are um, through a, a couple of little stories and, and a couple of little perspectives. So this is... Um, uh, our flag, we're Médecins Sans Frontières and we're a medical organisation. I took this picture in Haiti on, on my last day and we managed to somehow change, change the flag on my last day because it was in tatters before that. But um, anyway, so I am actually an A&E doctor. Uh, first joined MSF 2009. I still work in A&E here in the NHS in London um, and I prefer to go to MSF. And, and work in the other places that I've been, such as Iraq and Haiti, was where I was for the first year. And thereafter, in Lebanon for Syria, I went to South Sudan and um, I was in West Africa for Ebola. And then, uh, more recently, I've been on one of our rescue vessels on the Mediterranean and just now back from Raqqa in Syria. And I also sort of do some governance for MSF, so I work as the president and uh, represent the organization a little bit. So that's, that's a bit about me. Um, so who we are? Yeah, we are a medical organization. Um, we're founded on three principles of independence, neutrality, and impartiality. And uh, some people find it a bit difficult to tease out what the neutrality and impartiality is. And so we might be neutral in a conflict, but we will not select who we treat. We're medically impartial. The patient is the patient that is deserving of the medical input that we are there to give. And, and that's, the, that's the difference there. Thank you. Um, uh, we get nearly all of our money from, from private uh, sources. We don't take any money from governments uh, in Europe, none from America. Only, we actually only take money from Japan and Switzerland because they don't have armies and don't, don't uh, go around bombing places. Um, we're mainly volunteers in the first year. We sort of just have a tiny little stipend, but um, we tend to just try and get out there. You know, we, we go where a lot of people can't go or won't go. We use mopeds. I've been on canoes. We use donkeys. We use helicopters in South Sudan. I was flying around South Sudan with a helicopter doing mobile clinics for a month. So high tech, low tech, but we, we, we really don't mind to, to really get out there. We might sleep under the stars. We might sleep in a, in a house. Uh, so it's, it's, it's quite fun doing what we do. Uh, that picture, incidentally, is from uh, DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, probably a vaccination program. Uh, why do we respond? Well, it, it says there, so uh, about 50% of where we work is in armed conflict, post-conflict, unstable settings, uh, Syria, Yemen, South Sudan, particularly at the moment. Uh, epidemics, as you've heard, sort of Ebola, malnutrition, natural disasters. Haiti was a very big natural disaster. But we also choose. So those are what we call responses by default. You know, you, you just have to be there. There's a sudden disequilibrium in the, in the health uh, provision in, in, in that uh, context. But some places where we go not by default but by choice, where populations are excluded from healthcare. Uh, for example, uh, working with the Rohingya in Burma, in Burma. they're you know, in intentionally excluded from healthcare, and, and that is a, a, chronically, uh, a state of chronic disequilibrium that we try to interfere and, and, and bring back a bit of kindness to those people. We tend to work in lots of places. About two-thirds of our work is in Africa. Uh, you might see interesting sort of uh, European countries there. What's that about uh, with the migration and big flows of movements of people towards Europe from Libya, which is a little bit about the ship, uh, what I was doing working on the ship uh, in Libya. So we have uh, mental health and, and reception centers. We're famously the Calais uh, informal uh, um, settlement camp we were working in there. And a lot of tuberculosis in, in former Soviet republics. They're doing a lot of research, actually, something that's quite unusual for us. You wouldn't think that we're a medical research organization, but um, we, we you know, try and bring cheaper, safer medicines. That's, that's something else that we also do. Um, I mentioned our sort of three founding principles or our three sort of uh, core principles of independence, neutrality, and impartiality, but we have, we have a, uh, an operating value, something that we hold dear, something that puts us... Uh, sets us apart from the, the ICRC, the Red Cross, and it's, it's témoignage. Of course, we were 
born in France, so everything's a little bit French, and it means to bear witness. And my interpretation of that and something that's a little bit relevant to, to, to you here is that sort of we, we, we take it upon ourselves not to be silent in a situation where people don't have a voice or don't have an agency. And if we are there and we are with them and we are witnessing um, situations that are situations that are very hard to um, accept, that we will speak out. And that's what bearing witness and that's what témoignage means. And, and I think because of that founding principle, that's perhaps why we're a little bit different in being really happy to interact with the public, to put information out there, which in a, in a way is a way of marketing ourselves passively, I suppose, rather than aggressively or actively. I'm not going to try and use any digital marketing terms which were while I've been here this afternoon, but still very interesting to listen to. Um, and we do that in different ways. We might do it very privately. We might be, and we have our, we have our diplomats who do advocacy at, at the, in the right places to the right ministers and so forth. But we do things very publicly too to try and bring a little bit of pressure onto those politicians. So we might use press releases which can go out in all channels. Um, and we did one very recently about the Rohingya looking at um, the mortality survey, counting quite how many had died through violence. Um, starting at the very end of August of, of last year. I don't know if you, you saw a little bit of that in the news. So a group of people that are um, excluded uh, in Myanmar uh, on the basis of their religion. Um, we also did one about Libya at around the same time. So in Libya, there is now active slavery. Um, there is exploitation, sexual abuse, um, on, a, on a wide scale, you know, humans are a commodity in Libya. About $300 is the going rate for someone who is quite fit. Um, and we work in those detention centers. And uh, when I was working on the ship, people escaping Libya, trying to get across the Mediterranean, the death trap, are coming to Libya. They tell us the stories, both in the detention centers and on the ship. And they're quite harrowing stories. But we have to actually examine ourselves and say, it's quite a hard uh, debate that we have internally, but is it, are we just patching up the raw materials by giving healthcare in the detention centers just to, just to maintain their value for onward sale? And that's, that's quite a hard ethical debate that we have to hold with ourselves all the time, all the time whether we're being um, complicit in, in, in the act of detention illegally there. So it's a hard debate to have. But something else that we do a lot um, in trying to speak to our public is using a lot of social media. So I was very happy to be the first uh, to use, do the first Insta story for, for MSF when the time was. I think it was summer, summer 2016 when I was on the ship. I'm going to show you an example of what I did on Snapchat from the ship just, just uh, coming up now just to, for, for a little bit of fun. Um, uh, Facebook Live, yes, I did from Moscow last year with the W Health, uh, the w, uh, World Health Organization. So we're quite happy to tweet uh, in all languages um, to all sorts of groups. We, we look at perspectives so you can, you can follow whether you're more interested in our sea activities or our field activities or if Arabic or German or Greek or, or Russian is your first language. We have all of those channels. So we're, we're quite sort of um, keen on getting the message out there. Um, and of course, we do do little things like inserts and um, talks and engagements. Just going to try and speed up because we're near the end of the day. So this will play, hopefully, from a little bit halfway through. And it's just a, a short video that I made. Uh, so it's a, a series of s snaps that were strung together into a little video. You should be able to sort of see. I didn't say that at the beginning. I asked for the slides to be put on the side so you can have some better views from the back there if you can't see. Um, it, it was a little bit quiet. Um, for a couple of days there when the weather isn't quite so good, the little rubber dinghies can't get off the shore and there's 200 people in a rubber dinghy. And uh, so I had to try and be um, creative in, in trying to display some action. So I just thought, I know what, I'll, 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 oh, well, you'll see what I did. Um, but interestingly, so, so Aquarius, which is the ship, just, um, I'll tell you after it's actually here. Just, we'll just play, play the VT. We got a distress call from the captain. I wake up uh, everybody. Um, the SOS guys will get the rip one and rip two in the water, and that's how we start the operation. I go on rip two first. I give the safety instructions for the people, distribute life jacket, and stay until the last person is safely on our cars. 
I go out on rib one to look at everybody on board. I select out the sickest, the women and the children and take them back first to Aquarius. Angelina, Mark and I stay on board Aquarius to receive all the people and look after the sick ones while boat one ferries backwards and forwards until the last person is rescued and then Armani and boat two can come back. Since May 16th, by nearly 4,000 people on board, 23% of them have been under 18, 82% of those have been alone, and 15% of the people rescued were women. Ed, what are you up to? Um, I'm uh, sorting out all the toys. Uh, we uh, have a lot of children on board normally, so on one of my rescues we had 25 under fives, uh, so I'd like to give them a teddy. The reason we're here is people die crossing from Libya to Italy. In 2015, that was the number. This year, the number is 2742, and we're only seven months into the year. Cool. So that was just a little example of some snapping that we did um, from Aquarius. And I think it gives, it gives some information. If you've learned a tiny bit there about how we do a rescue. Sometimes rescues can be what we call tragic rescues where people end up in the water and they're very unsafe moments. So the last rescue Aquarius did before it went into dry dock for February, so just at the end of January, um, there were 83 people in the water and seven children um, drowned but were... Seven children, no, five children below the age of seven drowned, uh, and two women, uh, and all needed resuscitating, but the children survived, but the, the women did not. Children are a bit more resilient. But um, so, a, you know, a, a fun, light way of portraying some more harrowing things to, to a section of the public that might be watching, but um, I think a, a fun way of doing it. But smartphones have, have also just changed the way we work. So I was, uh, you know, I was in Raqqa just now, and I was working there for a month. And Raqqa fell. Uh, ISIS was expelled from, from Raqqa right at the end of October. And within three weeks, we had, had started a little emergency room in a civilian house just in one of the suburbs, in the western suburb. Nope, southeastern. I didn't get left and right. And, um, you know, there was no phone network. And there's no water and there's no electricity. And we had to, and I'm an A&E doctor, three beds in the living room of a house. You clear out the furniture, put you know, some medical things in. And uh, the IIS left a lot of improvised explosive devices, booby traps, all around the city, uh, in washing machines, under rubble, under beds, just really, um, how can I put it? Uh, very, very, very um, alternative and very, very um, frequent, like a, a high number of devices with a high um, different variety way of triggering them and a high different explosive. So you could have lots of people where their hand is just blown off by touching something. Lots of people have both their legs blown off or they put devices at head level to actually kill you. So very, you know, they were, yeah, anyway. Um, well, there's no phone network, and, and in that little emergency room, we have three beds, and we stabilize the cases when they come in. You've got to imagine that Raqqa is right now looking a little bit like Dresden was after the firebombing. It's just a shell of a city, and people want to come home from, from the camps around Syria, and they're finding that they're, they're, they're doing a, a de facto passive mine clearance just by setting these off themselves. The, the mine clearance isn't really happening in Raqqa at the moment. To a, to a great extent. But without phones, network, I can't refer my patients to the trauma hospital that we are running two hours north of Raqqa, where we have full surgical capabilities. But you're just in a living room. You stabilize your patient, and you pop them in a, in a truck, and you drive them to the, to the operating theater two hours north. But they need to know that that's coming all times of day, what's coming, what's been done to them. How do you get that information to them in a way that they can be ready? And you do it with a smartphone. So a couple of years ago, when I was um, in South Sudan, no phone network, fine, but you don't need to get that information across. And even if you did, you could, you could do it with a text. But this is a lot of information. You don't want to do a text. So a smartphone, we, we WhatsApped. And we were using a Wi-Fi network through satellite. And, you know, and, you can, and without that, there was no way we could communicate anything. So it was, I really reflected that it was 
a, a huge development for, for me personally in the way I work in MSF to use a smartphone rather than just an ordinary little Nokia that we usually use because they, they're bricks and you can't break them. But um, also it's changed the way we medically operate. So just a little example here, we've, we've managed to sort of develop a little device that you can add to the uh, camera of your, of your smartphone and put it down a microscope and get a really nice high-res picture like this and use telemedicine, which is actually based in Canada at all times of day, to work out what the bug is. Or we've added, um, uh, it's quite hard to sort of look in the back of someone's eye, particularly if it's light outside, you need batteries for the device and so forth. But um, it, a lot of doctors, I can't do it, I don't do it very well. You sort of, it's one of those examinations that you, in, in the UK, you just send them for a CT scan, you know. Um, but uh, in, in the back end of somewhere, you need to look at the back of the eyes, for example, to see if it's a, it's a severe case of malaria that's uh, attacking the brain, for example. And that's what this device does. So it just lets you sort of picture the retina really quite nicely. So that's something that smartphones have done for us um, in, a, in a really special way, just to make our life a little bit easier. And then we call it the peak. Um, and the next video is just a little video about my doogery, which is in, in Nigeria. Uh, how are we doing for time? I can just cut this last video. Just play some of it. Yeah? Um, it's, it's, it's just another example of how smartphones have changed what we do. So when you're doing malnutrition surveying, there's a lot of information that you need to get back to the right people. And, and, and this video explains why that's been changed with smartphones. But the context is that in fighting Boko Haram, the Nigerian government has sealed off a vast swathe of territory in northeastern um, Nigeria. And, and de facto, anyone living there has been labeled as a, 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 a apologists or people who, are, who want to be with Boko Haram. And so there's, there's a lot of food insecurity and a lot of medical uh, needs. But we were able to use smartphones in a, in, a, in a clever little way just to help really tailor what our operations should be in terms of who should get the food when and where. So it's a little video describing that, if you can play. With the smartphone, it's very easy because I'm not holding anything in my hand. It's just the smartphone that I'm holding with me. And using the smartphone, I used to save it. You see, information I kept safer in the smartphone. But using the paper, maybe I have to make mistake, clean, the work will look dirty, and I have to carry paper, information can e easily be lost. The main advantage of this is that it's a massive gain of time, and straight away we have all the information together. So this way, at the end of every day, we actually know how many people we visited, how many children we measured, how many of them were or were not malnourished, and we can see each day, each week, each month, over three months, we can actually see all the numbers together. Yeah, that's it. So I mean, just uh, some three small examples there of, of uh, how smartphones have changed what we work, how we work. Um, so I'll leave it there. I'll say thank you. I'll say thank you again to Luke for having me and thanks for listening. And it's been a long afternoon. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, a couple of questions. Do you want to take a stool? Yeah. yeah. There you go. So thank you very much. I mean, that really was very, very, very powerful. Um, just a couple of questions, yeah. really. Um, we started today talking about technology, mm. and you've identified some of that technology that you're using in the field. If there was one additional piece of technology that you could have that would make a big difference, what would that be? Well, I mean, I think it probably exists, but we don't have it yet. Something like portable Wi-Fi that you can wind up in a box. Okay. Does it, I think it, there are definitely prototypes out there, aren't they? Electricity-free Wi-Fi, basically. Electricity-free And, free you know, cable-free wi That would just, as you saw, I mean, as, just from my experience in Raqqa, you know, if we did not have WhatsApp, yeah. we, would be, we would be communicating with paper, yeah, uh, um, pigeons. You know, pigeons. Literally, pigeons, yeah. and you don't, you know, you don't want a trauma team to wait, be woken at three a.m. by a double bilateral below, you know, leg amputation, yeah. just uh, and have to operate. <laughs> and you want to be prepared, you yeah. know, and, and that yeah. that needs 
for, forward planning and communication. So. I think Elon Musk put a, a Wi-Fi satellite into space yesterday. So Did he? He might be helping you out on that one. <laughs> Mate, I think. If you do have any questions on Slido, please um, pop, pop them in there now, I think. Um, we spoke earlier on about you know, some, any, anything that we've been talking about today. I'm mm. not going to ask you what your view on attribution is, don't worry. <laughs> um, but you know, when, when you know, I've been aware of MSF for a long time, and, and in our kind of research prior to this, you know, something that became very, very evident was that MSF is doing something different from a marketing perspective. Um, in that it's having a conversation with consumers. Um, you're not saying, I don't think I've ever seen you say anywhere, donate now, please give us some money now. It's always been an educational message that you've, that you've put out there. Um, and you've talked today about how you've used some technology. Could you just share some of the thinking, if you, if you can, in terms of how MSF is approaching kind of the conversations that you're trying to have with people? We, um as I said, I think, I think it sort of, I wonder if it came by chance with that, that core value that we have of, of témoignage in, in terms of just getting information out to people who might be interested. Yeah. And I wonder if it, it's just been a sort of, knowing MSF a little bit, a lot of things just sort of happen, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, haphazardly. We're, we're, not, we're not that professional in, if I could be really transparent, we, I don't believe we're hugely professional in really meticulously planning things like this, like what you've been talking about today and so forth. And it's been really interesting to hear that. Well, you said something but, earlier on, which actually mm. shows that you're quite far ahead of some advertisers, yeah. which is that you, you think about customer lifetime value. Yeah. And that the value of a customer making a monthly five pound donation is, I mean, they were your It's much more, it's much more. And so we do, I mean, uh, James, our fundraising manager here in the UK would, um, which is essentially <coughs> what might be a sales manager of mm. the business or something, I don't know. But he, he, he says time and time again that we have this integrated comms and fundraising model. Um, and, I, and I read into between those lines saying that, yeah, we don't necessarily um, make asks. We just put the information out there. So another example is with our um, higher value donors. For example, we have a stewardship program. So uh, more than once a year, we have them in, just 20, 25 of them at a time. And it's purely um, information. This is what we're doing. This is where we are. And they get access to someone like me, others who have been in the field, higher executives. And it's, it's just that. And so that's quite um, a comfortable, non-aggressive environment. Yeah. And I think that pans out into to, to on all, all our levels of donors. It's quite unnerving, these numbers flashing yeah. at us down here, isn't it? There's one really, you know, very serious question in here, which I'm going to save for the Meet the Speakers okay. afterwards. So whoever put this question in, please, please do um, meet Javid and ask it. I've got one final question. It's a really important one. Yeah. Um, what was your favourite children's programme growing up? Do you know, I was sitting next to a guy called Nick who was from Italy and he... He couldn't think of one either. I can't quite see him in the crowd now. But um, I didn't, uh, so I only came to England when I was seven. So okay. your question was when you're five. Okay. And in Sudan, I don't even recall us having a TV, actually. So <laughs> I couldn't answer it. So then I thought, what did I watch at seven? And I, I just can't remember. Can't That's remember. a really fudge answer, isn't it? Oh, right. You're going to have literally to put Inspector Gadget on the TV. Well, when I, you yeah, when you sh I recognized all of those yeah. when you showed them. So I must have been watching those programs. Very good. <laughs> Javid, thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.